I know the world seems like it's going crazy and it's going faster, and it is, but I've got news for you. The real panic hasn't even started yet. Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Chris Martinson of Peak Prosperity, and I've got a really important update here for you. And it starts here with this idea that the real panic hasn't even started yet. So what do I mean by that? Look, stock markets, everybody focuses on the stock markets because these are a prime narrative signaling device for the powers that be. Because stocks are going up and they're going up into the right, everybody feels wealthier, even though most stocks are not owned, but by a very small percentage of people. And the Federal Reserve and other central banks like to signal that everything is well. So they use the stock markets to show that everything is well. So right now, people are starting to worry, oh, my gosh, are stocks starting to correct? We've had a number of red down days. But let me get my little laser pointery tool out here to follow along with you. But this is what we're talking about here is this little dip here. But this is the Dow Jones here up here in your top left coming down one. This is the Nikkei. So this is Japanese stocks. Same thing went up very strong starting in November and December, up through until just recently, a little downturn. NASDAQ, hmm, little downturn of late. The German DAX, the DX, little downturn of late. S&P 500, little downturn of late. Uh, Euro stocks, the all European stocks, top 50, little downturn of late. Russell 2000, little weaker. These are the small caps. And then this is the BIX, the volatility index, volatility uh, just basically getting hammered and suppressed downwards as stocks went upwards. This is the heart of the financial deception. It's the narrative control. It's here to tell you that everything is going well. And by the way, something scared them very badly at the end of October of 2023, starting November 1st, we saw this just ruler straight powering upwards. And that is the situation we're in. Now, my view of this, however, is this. The Federal Reserve, that's the Fed, that's the gentleman in the center. And, and they're keeping the Dow Jones plate spinning and they got the USD up there and they got the government bonds, they got the S&P, the NASDAQ. So they're doing everything they can to keep all these plates spinning, but they've lost a couple. First, they lost inflation. It That's much is clear. Now they talk about it like, oh, the rate of inflation's come down. It's not that bad. But since you've been to the grocery store and you've seen your auto insurance and your home insurance a spike by double digit percentages, and you know that your medical insurance is not the minus 3% that the government's trying to tell us it was. Believe it or not, they're trying to tell you that. Um, you know that uh, this is absolute bunk and inflation is very bad and it's entrenched. And of course they know this and they know why, because they're the ones who printed all the money up and threw it into the system. And they know full well, better than anybody, what that's going to do. If they don't understand the connection between money printing and inflation, that would be like going to a doctor who isn't aware that antibiotics are useful against a bacterial infection. It would be that level of malfeasance and incompetence. So either the Federal Reserve is gaslighting us along with the BLS and, and BEA out of the government, U.S. government. They Either they're gaslighting us and lying to us knowingly, or they are completely incompetent midwits. You choose which poison you want to believe in. But the most important plate that the Fed has now dropped is that one, reputation and trust. Every time they lie to us, every time they gaslight us, every time they inerringly choose the system and big banks over the needs of the little people, every time they do what they can to keep all these plates spinning, rather than let natural capitalist market forces take over, they are damaging that trust. And of course, the Federal Reserve is the entity solely responsible for throwing the entire younger generations under the economic bus. How did they do that? By specifically lowering the cost of mortgages so that the house price index would go up, making houses less affordable for young people because they cost more. And then when houses are all, you know, very high prices, then jacking the mortgage cost up so that affordability through the floor. Young people cannot form households. That is a generational crime. And they should be held to account for that. But this is just the 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 day-to-day, -day, you know, hour-to-hour, minute-to-minute, um, stuff that the Federal Reserve is doing to monkey around and keep all these plates spinning, but they won't be able to do it much longer. And I'm going to tell you why today. Hello, everyone. I am Chris Martinson of Peak Prosperity, and I want you to be aware that the mechanisms that can seize your assets are already in place. Look, you can ignore this information or you can take action by joining our essential webinar to avoid becoming Wall Street's next victim. 
Look, whether you're curious or seeking to protect your wealth or you are a financial expert, our webinar offers critical strategies from industry leaders. You will learn seven key tactics to safeguard your assets before the next crisis hits. Sign up by May 15th for a 20% discount or subscribe to Peak Prosperity to save even more. And of course, my key supporters at Peak Prosperity attend for free. Thank you for listening. And now back to our program. And it begins with this. My big picture overview, my BPO, starts here with this chart by Art Berman of Labyrinth Consulting. And here what we're looking at is oil consumption compared to GDP. These are both log charts, okay? So it's a, it's a log axis on both dimensions here. And along the x-axis, you have oil consumption. And up the y-axis, you have GDP. And you'll notice something. Each one of those dots is a country. This is 2020 data. So each one of those dots is the GDP of a country mapped against its oil consumption for the year 2020. And you could do this year in, year out, and it's the same chart. It basically says the same thing. If you're going to have more GDP, you're going to be burning more oil, right? That's just how that works, right? So more oil, more GDP. Bing, and you end up on that chart. And it's a straight line. And because it's a straight line, it tells us how powerful this relationship is. And you don't find any dots mysteriously way down there, or way over there. They all fall on this line. It tells us that there's a very powerful connection between how much oil you burn and how much economy you got. And of course, this makes a lot of sense, right? So if you went out, went out to a overpass and you just watched cars and trucks flying by, or maybe they're caught in a traffic jam and moving slowly, but you're watching all of these vehicles moving along a highway and you look up and you see all the planes flying overhead. And maybe you're near a port and you see all these ships coming in. Each one of those things that's moving is a unit of economic activity. It could be that you've got somebody in a car heading to a baseball game where they're going to buy a ticket, sit down and have a hot dog and a beer, right? That's all economic activity. Maybe it's a truck rolling by and it's got mattresses that just came off one of these ships and those are going to a warehouse, right? That's economic activity. When you see planes, trains, and automobiles moving around, that's economic activity. The more economic activity you have, the more planes, trains, and automobiles you have rolling around. That means the more oil that you burn. And that's just for transportation. Remember, 30% of oil isn't moving stuff around. That's how we think about it. We've been trained to think about it. It's diesel. It's gasoline. 30% of oil is used for petrochemicals. It's for the plastics. It's for the olefin resins. It's for the precursors that are used in every possible manufacturing process out there to give us pharmaceuticals and you know, high quality epoxy resins and paints and all kinds of stuff, right? So, hey, this is simple. If we're going to have a robust, vibrant economy in the future, we're going to need more oil. That's what this chart says. Very clearly, sit down, meditate on it until you understand this chart. And it explains a lot about where we are in the story and what's going to happen. Looking at just electricity, we get the same story. So again, on log charts, two things being mapped against each other. One would be electricity consumption, and the other is GDP per capita. So this is per capita per person, electricity consumption mapped against per person per capita GDP, one against the other. And what happens? Well, again, we find a pretty straight line. There's a little, little slope to it over to you. Maybe you could see how, the, how there's maybe an arky thing going on there, but pretty much it's a straight line. But most importantly, in that red circled area, there is no such thing as a low energy rich country. It doesn't happen. There's just, it hasn't been solved. You know why? Because you need electricity, you know, electricity to have the lights on, to keep your food cold, to operate your machines and your factories. Electricity is a necessary component to have an industrialized, that is a high GDP economy. Again, there's a relationship here, energy and the economy. I showed it in oil. I've showed it for electricity. It's really, really important. Now, I know a lot of you are thinking, hey, Chris, but the United States turned into Saudi America. We're geniuses. We're very clever. And you know what? Because we're clever, we unlocked a lot of this oil. And indeed, we did through something called the shale oil place. But let's look at this again in a chart from Art Berman of Labyrinth Consulting. He's responsible for everything up to right around here. And then my beautiful, amazing artistic abilities gave us these projections going forward. So up to here where the numbers stop right down here, that's art stuff. And you would see if it stopped right here that, indeed, U.S. oil production is hit an all-time high, but that is because it's a stacked component array. Let's talk about it very quickly. In green, on the bottom, conventional oil in the lower 48 states, that is cheap 
oil. That's a euphemism. Conventional oil is a euphemism for cheap oil. That was the cheap stuff. It peaked back in 1970. And no matter how clever, how incentivized, how amazing our petroleum engineers and rough hands and field hands are, it is what it is. Oil fields have an upslope and they have a downslope. Good news. We also discovered stuff in Alaska. This is the Prudhoe Bay discovery right here. And Alaska, too, has been dwindling down. Good news. We discovered offshore oil out here in the Gulf of Mexico. And that's actually increased a bit of late because we're out there drilling like crazy in the offshore arena in the Gulf of Mexico, which is, is a tasty field set out there. It's good stuff. Everything you've been hearing about is this red stuff, which is called tight oil. It's shale oil. Here's the thing about shale oil. Easy come, easy go. You can get to it quickly. The, the, the wells run out really, really quickly. So if all the projections are currently accurate that exist out there, and this is taking projections from the US EIA, which is the Energy Information Agency, and from private sources and models, and you put it in there, give or take a little, this is what the future of US oil production looks like. That tight oil is going to run down about as fast as it ran up just is what it is. Same story for shale gas production. This is the Barnett play. That's a shale basin. The Barnett mostly is just producing gas, dry gas, in fact, natural gas, good stuff. It's awesome. Look at this. It's amazing. Saudi America, we're coming up. It goes up, it bumps along, it hits a peak, and it's been going down. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the story. We're not going to get any more out over time. There's no like second big bump here for the, the Barnett production, unless, you know, gas prices go really, really high and they just throw everything they've got at it and they just drill it all up, but then it'll spike and fall even faster. Guess what? Oil fields, individual oil wells, there's an arc to them. You punch the well in there and it starts getting more and more and more oil out and then it falls off. And that's the end of that. That's just how it is. And that's the story. And by the way, that story is the same in the UK. It's actually true everywhere, but here's the UK looking at all these different mature fields that they actually have starting back here in 2015. These are all their named fields that were drilled way back here in much earlier eras, but you can see them. They're all going to wind down and basically be gone mm, somewhere around now. But fortunately they've been stacking all these other new fields and wells and all that. And even still like, like this, and this was a giant set of fields here, this blue swath, but this is the story. This is what it looks like in the oil story you get and gas as well you get more and more and more and then you get less and less and less and that's just geology it's nothing personal it's not saying we're not clever very clever monkeys all of us um some more than others and the petroleum people are about as clever as you get and it's amazing i love what they do and i'm glad for it here we see that the global majors have the same i showed you shale gas in the u.s i showed you what's happening in the uk and now let's just take a look at the world. These are the global majors. So this is people like Chevron, Exxon, Royal Dutch Shell, etc. And you can see here they were growing their output more and more and more. And then, oh, no, big fall off. And here they've been bumping along, but basically producing about the same as they have since, well, I don't know, where are we there? 19, early 1980s. So that's with hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars of investment and exploration and taking risk and going to new countries. I put these up because it's basically as go the majors, kind of so goes the world. They're everywhere. If there's oil there, you'll find these people giving it a go and trying. Now, this used to be the lonely province of people like me. And we would talk about, hey, there's this thing called peak oil. And oh my gosh, we will run out someday but not all on next Tuesday. I mean, it's a long, slow tapering process, but we're going to transition from an era of getting more and more and more and more to a bumpy place where we kind of get the same, the same, the same, and then we'll get less and less and less. And it won't really matter how hard we try because it's geology and it's a finite resource. This shouldn't be hard, but it's a very hard thing for a lot of people to get their minds around because it's an emotional process, not, not an intellectual one. I, I get that, but we're not alone anymore. Over here in Crazy Corner, talking about these things, we now have J.P. Morgan's commodity desk on our side saying, hey, as they look forward and add it all up, they say that they see a 1.1 million barrel per day supply deficit emerging in 2025, which is right around the corner because I'm recording this in April of 2024. And they see that widening to 7.1 million barrels per day by 2030. So over those five years, 
a 1 million barrel per day deficit balloons into a 7 million barrel per day deficit. And again, they do the same thing. They say here there's baseline supply. So this is the old fields that we say you drill them and then they start declining like this, right? And then here's non-OPEC replacement. So not the OPEC countries, but everybody else in the world. This is what they should be able to replace, you know, tens of millions of barrels a day by the end. That's awesome. And then there's um, what OPEC can possibly do, but OPEC is kind of out of the game now. They can't supply a lot more because they've they've been there. They've done that. They've drilled their stuff up. And um, this is total supply in red. And this black demand is not doing anything crazy. We don't have this supply demand shortfall because demand has done something really spiky, crazy, amazing. It's just trundling along at about one and a half million barrels per day of a new demand next year as compared to this year and every year going out. So this supply demand can't exist. That, that gap, supply demand gap can't exist. What, what is going to happen is if that supply, then prices have to go up to crush that black line down to meet the red line. That gap will be closed by prices. That's how this works. So what does that mean? Well, if you remember back to that chart I showed you that GDP and oil are intimately linked, and all of a sudden we're going to be taking 7 million barrels a day of oil out of the overall economic equation, your next question should be, which portions of the, where in the world is that GDP going to take it in the shorts? Because that's what we're saying. If more GDP requires more oil, when you take oil away, well, GDP's got to fall to that same level, where, when, and how. Now, this is principally going to be a story of increasingly painful decisions that people are going to have to make at the individual level. Am I going to drive this week? Am I going to drive or afford food this week? Inflation feeds through badly off of oil. So there's a lot of things that are going to happen. Some countries are going to really get caught on the short end of this because they won't be able to afford this oil. Other countries will, but this is a new regime. Nobody's ready for this. We don't have anybody in Congress or the Senate or approaching the White House was any clue what this means yet. So that means you have an opportunity here to have a big picture understanding of what's going on so you can begin to adjust yourself around what these realities are going to be when this starts to bite. What could change this? Well, a global depression that crushes demand, but that doesn't sound that fun. Or some mysterious source of supply that I don't know about. Always possible, but you know me. You have to show it to me first. When the data changes, I'll change my mind this is the best we got right now. To really understand what this means, though, to really get into this, we're going to have to back up a step. We're going to have to ask a really primary fundamental question, which is, well, what is wealth? Now, give me a second and I'll connect that into the whole oil economy story. It works like this. So if you asked me today, or if I asked you and said, who's the wealthiest person in town? Dude, we're going to say, show me the ones and zeros on their bank statements that combine into some dollar value or yen or euro value, depending where you live. We're going to say, show me their portfolio of financial assets and maybe what their real estate is. So we're pointing to some things. A lot of it is not actually wealth. We call it wealth. We're marketed to that that's wealth. We think about it as wealth, but it's not wealth. And here's the case I'm going to make for that. Primary wealth is stuff like this, right? It would be rich soils, not industrially raped dirt that has no nutrients or life or worms in it. I mean, soil, rich soils like we had in the United States when the prairies, they first started plowing them over six feet of top soil, not top dirt, right? Big difference between that clean waters that don't have to be treated with get the microplastics and hormones out so you can not die drinking it. Clean waters, thick coal seams there, rich ore bodies, teeming fishing grounds, Lots of oil and gas in the ground, things like that. So let's a uh, thought experiment. Let's imagine that you own an island, but this island has just rocks and sand on it, not, in, not even a single tree. What do you have? Well, you have no primary wealth. You have no soil. You have no water. You have no energy. What you have is a, is a chunk of land upon which you could basically fashion no economy. Sorry, there's nothing really you could do there unless, you know, banging rocks together on sand is, is uh, economic activity. You know, maybe, maybe you could import an economy, right? Turn your little pile of rock and sand into a tax haven. But then your tax haven is developing its value because somebody somewhere else has access to stuff like this, right? If every nation in the world was just rocks and sand, we would have no economy. 
and there wouldn't really be anything to talk about. So this is the source of all wealth. This is the primary wealth of any nation. The amazing stuff you are naturally bequeathed with and blessed with as a nation pretty much determines what your what your economic possibilities are going to be going forward, okay? Then people organize, and we convert the ore bodies into steel tubing. We get the fish out of the ocean or the lakes, and we bring them to the dinner plate or to the market. We bring the soil is converted into fruits and vegetables. Those get to market. The trees get turned into lumber, etc. So the secondary product, the secondary wealth is the output, the productive output from the primary wealth, right? So, but you have to have the primary wealth before you can get the secondary wealth. Like if I have an island nation, no trees on it, I'm going to have a hard time making lumber as my secondary wealth. So there's a transitive rule here. Primary wealth begets secondary wealth. If I don't have any primary wealth, I can't make any secondary wealth out of it, right? I might be over-endowed with a certain form of primary wealth. I'm an oil nation. Great, I can take that piece and then trade it for all the other things. But this is really important. Wealth has no meaning. What we think of as wealth, tertiary wealth, has no meaning outside of the things you can buy with it. And that's real tangible stuff that comes from the world in its primary wealth that then gets transformed into secondary wealth by humans. And then we all think about wealth as tertiary wealth. This is the former UBS trading floor. All those humans are gone. It's now just computers and ones and zeros and blinking lights and pinging stuff around at light speed to skim pennies off of every transaction. And it sounds amazing. And the people who run those tertiary wealth machines seem to be getting obscenely rich. But you know what? They don't actually produce anything. They don't produce any wealth. They are skimming the wealth and figuring out how to divvy up the skimmings um, between and amongst themselves. But let's not confuse what they do with wealth creation. But yeah, it's easy to make the confusing jump because we're told all the time, these are the wealthiest people. The Ken Griffiths of the world, the Ray Dalios. These are the people, they're the wealthiest. They are out there using their financial prowess to take you know financial assets and accumulate them towards themselves. These are the Black Rocks. These are Heck, let's face it, we actually mostly have a financialized economy in the United States right now where, for example, GMAC is the profit-producing center of General Motors that happens to have a little car company bolted to the side. But it's the financing of the cars that actually earns them their profit, not the building of the cars. This is just the vehicle to allow the financing to happen. So we've gone full over the tips of our skis into this world of believing our own narrative that tertiary wealth is wealth. And it's an easy mistake to make because we've been here for quite a while, but make no mistake. Without primary and secondary wealth, tertiary wealth has no value. So, back to our little sandy rocky island. Let's imagine you're on it. Hey, I drop ship a pallet of $100 bills, billion dollars worth. There they are. You're probably going to value the wood in the pallet and the plastic wrapping as highly as you will the paper in the dollars uh, themselves because they have no, you can't spend them. I mean, what use are they? Their use is whatever their intrinsic use is. This is a very hard concept to get our minds around because there's so much programming to push us towards this idea that these intangible abstractions are real wealth when they're not. Real wealth is tangible. Everything else is an abstraction, a derivative, something that's a claim. And there's a rule that comes out of this, which is that you can never have or you should never have more tertiary wealth, that is more claims than there are actual real wealth things underneath them. This is the pyramid shape. There should be more primary wealth than secondary wealth, right? You should have vastly more oil in the ground than you do refining capacity. And on top of that, there ought to be less debt saddled on top of that refinery than that refinery could process and earn back out of that primary source of wealth. So this is the stable relationship. It's a triangle pyramid shape. And that's what it should look like. Now, you get in trouble when that thing inverts, right? When you get tons and tons and tons of tertiary wealth and there's less secondary wealth and maybe the primary wealth is actually dwindling. So what's an example? Um, well, there's places in the American sort of west, southish west, where there are farmers farming on top of something called the Ogallala Aquifer. They're drawing it down. They don't can't actually farm using just the rainfall that comes, so they have to supplement with the aquifer water. That aquifer water is being drawn down. That aquifer water is the primary wealth. It's being sucked out of the ground to create the secondary wealth. And then the farms on top of that have loans and income streams and expenses, and it all balances out in their productive enterprises. The value of those enterprises can never be larger 
than the amount of water that sits down there that they could draw upon because that's the primary wealth in the story. And when, not if, but when at current rates, that primary wealth goes away, that aquifer is sucked dry, then this whole pyramid collapses. The tertiary wealth parked on top of that aquifer no longer has value. Now, to really get our arms around this, we have to understand this concept, that all money is loaned into existence. Every money system has features and benefits, pros and cons. Every money system enforces some behaviors, punishes others, enables some things, doesn't allow other things. We happen to live in what's known as a debt-based fiat money system. It's cool. It has features. It has benefits, pros and cons. Uh, the cons are about to come back and bite us in the butt. And that's what we have to be talking about here today because of some features about that. And the core feature is, is that it's loaned into existence. Right. Most people, this is hard to understand, and, and don't worry if you don't get it, because even the Bank of England had to study this and wrote a paper, which I think came out in 2014, where they're like, hey, turns out money's loaned into existence, like caught them like a thunderbolt. Like, how did they not know this? Like, I've been, people have been talking about this for a long time. Bank of England finally caught up to the whole thing. They're like, oh, this is, this is awkward. Turns out money's loaned into existence. So what does that mean? What would that look like? <clears throat> so imagine this. Uh, you go down to the bank and you're going to take out a $500,000 loan for a mortgage, okay? They clickety-clack, here's your check for $500,000, you take it over to the closing, and it's part of the purchase price for your house, along with your down payment, right? Okay, where did that $500,000 come from? Now, you might think that they took it out of a vault or the electronic equivalent because people had deposited money at the bank, and then they lent it to you. Uh -uh. They don't even have to have any money in the bank. They can just clickety-clack. And they create your $500,000 note, which is your liability, but it's the bank's asset. And those two things come together like that. That's the banking system. John Kenneth Galbraith, the famous Harvard economist, and I will, Harvard used to have really good people working there. They've lost the plot, obviously, lately. But uh, John Kenneth was a quote machine. And one of the things he said was, the process by which banks create money is so simple that the mind is repelled. So it's a very simple concept, right? Money's loaned into existence. And you're probably going, mm, that doesn't, no, mm, you're probably repelled a little bit. But trust me, it's the case. Now, money is actually a social agreement, right? It has value because we says it does. And money, we understand then, what we call money is actually a claim on primary and secondary wealth. So what do I mean by that? Back to our island. You have your little pallet of $100 bills. You like the plastic because you can turn that into a raincoat if necessary. The pallet's good because you can maybe fashion a little structure out of it to keep you out of the out of the shelter. But the dollar bills, eh, maybe you start fires with them. I don't know if you got a way to do that. But if you could begin to buy things with those $100 bills because a, sh uh, a ship showed up and was willing to trade with you, what would you buy? Dude, you'd be buying all kinds of secondary and primary wealth. You'd be buying food and energy and stuff, right? Okay, so that means that the money you have is a claim. And it's a claim on the stuff you want. I, why do you and I have money? I, I like money. I like having money in my wallet because I can go somewhere and take it out and get something with it, right? Food or an experience or that somebody else has had to expend energy putting that experience together. You know, maybe it's a show I want to go see. Whatever the story is, that money has value because it's a social agreement. We agree that my $100 bill can be spent in Atlanta or Sacramento or in Fairbanks or, you know, Fort Worth. doesn't matter. It's that social agreement that it has value and it's enforced in it that it has value. But it really has value, not because we say so, but because we can use it to buy things with it, like secondary and primary wealth. Okay. Well, if that's money, if money itself, what we call money, is actually currency, not money, because um, it violates some of the tenets of money. If, if our currency has value because we can buy things with it, well, then, then what's debt? Well... This is where we have to introduce time into the story. My currency has current value because I can spend it now on things. So my, current, my money is a current claim on current things. Debt is a claim then on future money. What does that mean? Well, let's imagine that I take out this mortgage that we just talked about, $500,000 for 30 years. So for the next 360 months, month in, month out, without missing a single month, I'm going to be taking mon currency that I had in that future month, and I'm going to be using that to pay off the mortgage I took out all those months ago. So that mortgage might have been taken out 212 months ago, but I'm going to be still using current 
at that time, currency to pay it off. So debt is a claim on future money. Why does this matter? It matters if and only if you find out that the amount of debt in your society has been accumulating and piling up and piling up faster than your stuff. There has to always be a defined relationship and a good one between the amount of stuff you got, which is your economy, and the amount of debt you have, because the debt is a claim on that stuff. But what if that debt was growing faster than the stuff? Well, now you have a math problem on your hands. And by the way, it's not just a lone crank talking about that anymore. Now I got Jerome Powell on my side. He was there in front of uh, Cynthia Loomis, uh, re Republican senator out of Wyoming. She asked him a question about, hey, this debt that the United States government is accumulating, is this a problem? Now, this shouldn't be Jerome Powell's answer to give because he's a monetary authority. They're running the money system. Cynthia and her ilk are responsible for the fiscal side. She's asking a fiscal question of a monetary guy, but Jay's a nice guy. So he answered and he said, oh, about that debt. The problem is that we're on a path where the debt is growing substantially faster than the economy. And that, by definition, is, in the long run, is unsustainable. Look, this is a real problem we're going to have here. And uh, Jay is just telling us about it as kindly as he can. That's as clear a warning as you're ever going to get. So read that again carefully if you need to. All right, well, let's read it again together. The problem is that we're on a path where the debt is growing substantially faster than the economy, and that, by definition, in the long run, is unsustainable. What does unsustainable look like, you ask? Well, looks like this. This is a chart of just federal debt. This is just federal debt. doesn't include anything else. Oh, wait, let me update it. It needs updating. Ah, uh, there we go. Yeah, that's what it looks like now. So this is not sustainable, obviously, and it's just, you can't just constantly grow your debt forever and ever faster and faster. And we can see it's not sustainable in this chart, which is showing U.S. interest payment scenarios. This is from Bank of America's Global Investment Strategy. Uh, the Cobasi letter here on Twitter is where I found this chart. But it's very good. It says, it, asks, it says, hey, um, what if, how much would the U.S. government be paying in interest payments by December of 24, that's at the end of this calendar year, if the Fed cuts interest rates by 150 basis points? And the answer is, well, $1.2 trillion, roughly. Well, what if, um, what, what if uh, the rates are stable, though? The Fed can't cut by the end of the year. Well, now the U.S. government's paying $1.6 trillion per year just in interest payments. Just in interest payments. Now, what does that mean? Let me put it in context. Federal interest expense under that no-cut scenario will equal 72% of personal income taxes. This doesn't include corporate taxes or FICA, but just personal income taxes. April 15th just happened uh, at the time of this recording, and you have to pen out those checks, and you know how much money you had to pay in personal income taxes. So this should be a number you're highly familiar with as a U.S. citizen. And here's the answer. Um, $1.6 trillion is 72% of current personal income taxes, 72 cents out of every dollar you will have paid is going to be going out to pay interest expense on the federal debt. And it is exploding higher. That's what this chart looks like. This is um, a hockey stick chart. Things are going very, very fast now. If you've been a follower of my work, you know, this is an exponential chart. And you understand that we are in the final five minutes of this story. This chart is water racing up the stadium stairs. If you don't know what any of those words I just said meant, go look up in the crash course the chapter on compounding on exponential growth, and it's it's very impactful. Everybody should be familiar with it. That's where we are. It's very hard to wrap your mind around exponential growth and exponential functions. They move really quick at the end, faster than our human minds can comprehend, and way faster than our linear, sclerotic, political machines can actually adapt and respond. So this this is a crack up right here, and it's coming, and hardly anybody's ready for it. This is shocking right here. <clears throat> so listen, <clears throat> the panic really hasn't started yet, but this chart says we are not that far away from that happening. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. Again, what Jay Powell was calling not sustainable, fairly easy to understand. The claims is the debt, right? And that's a claim on future money, which means it's a claim on the future economy. That's what debt is. We've established that. The stuff is GDP. That's the bottom dotted line, clocking in at close to $30 trillion for this year, 
The next readout we're going to have on the claims, which is debt in the United States system. And that's that's the federal debt, which we talked about. But it also includes household debt and corporate debt and state debt and muni debt and all that. All the debt. It's going to be around $100 trillion. This is astonishing. There's only about $320, $30 trillion of debt in the world. And the United States has a third of it with maybe 6% of the world's population, 5 6%. It, it, we're very over leveraged. The United States is very over leveraged. And still people are loaning us tons of money out there in the world through our treasury programs. But this is what it looks like. And so even without understanding the exponential compounding chapter of the crash course, you can just eyeball this and see what everybody else sees, which is that one of these two lines, the top one is growing, growing away from the bottom line. And it's true for the past 50, 60 years, that top line has been compounding at an annualized rate of 8.8% per year. And the bottom line has been compounding at a rate of less than half that. This is just a math problem. That's what Jay Powell was talking about. Well, by definition, it's unsustainable. Yeah, it's also it's just a math problem. And you know, there's only two ways to accomplish getting off of this. Either you wait for it to break or you fix it on your own terms. Nobody's fixing it um, on our own terms at this point. And by the way, let me bust out my awesome awesome artistic skills and sort of extend that chart out this is what it's going to look like over time nobody anyone anyone bueller i'm still waiting for anybody to explain how this works out this should be on every like every single congressman congresswoman senator ought to be asked asked and they should be able to answer this question like dudes where are we going how, how, how does this what's your plan here how does this pencil out right are we going to attack another country and steal their wealth and pay this off? Or are we going to grow our economy really furiously? But you understand the relationship between oil and economy. So where's that oil growth going to come from? It's not coming out of our shale fields, that's for sure. So where are we getting it from? Are we going to not let China have it? Are we going to fight them for it? What are we fighting with? Hypersonic missiles, cyber warfare? What's happening? There's no plan. That's why I do what I do. That's why we're having this conversation, because this is simple stuff, logically, to speak about. You might be surprised, like, why am I hearing it from you? Why am I not hearing this from my ostensible leadership? It's because they don't know what to do. Many of them don't have the context. Some of them aren't smart enough to pull this off and understand it. Oh, the moon is made out of gases, right? Um, that's a congresswoman just said uh, recently. So, uh, but still, it doesn't matter if they're ignorant or purposely obstinate. This is still the situation. And by the way, this is going down on your watch. And by the way, this is going to be biting really soon, by 2030 at the latest. And that's why I say, listen, the real panic hasn't even started yet. Once enough people understand what's going on here and can connect this back to the oil situation, that's when the panic starts. And remember, panic early to avoid the rush. So this is what putting it on the national credit card looks like. These are treasury debt outstanding bonds here are things that are anywhere from, um, seven sorry 10 years or longer so this is the 10 20 30 year u.s treasury bonds notes anything from one to seven years is this medium blue color bills is anything less than a year and they've really been slapping these on right we went from basically less than a trillion back here and now there's i don't know whatever that number is five six trillion of them now and then other presumably tips and things like that um treasury inflation protected security so but this is all short-term stuff and that's why the U.S. government interest payment chart is so sensitively dependent on interest rates, because when interest rates go up and they have to refund this stuff because they're never paying it back, but they're just re-upping it, it's re-upping at the new higher rate. So this is a, this is just this is a national credit card. That's what that's what this is. And by the way, back to our really feckless, awful leadership, Mike Johnson here, uh, ostensible leader of the House, Speaker of the House uh, representing Republicans, doesn't matter, uniparty, all one party at this point in time. Yeah, say, yeah, yeah, you know, not only are we going to extend warrantless spying on Americans, because we all know that privacy and private property had no real place in the American prosperity experiment. So we're just going to get rid of that because um, yeah, I'm a moron and or I'm being he's probably being blackmailed. I'm going to guess at this stage. Nothing else really fits the data uh, as well. And uh, yeah, 100 billion in foreign aid, you know, we'll give it a, go get it blown up in Ukraine, the money laundering operation of Eastern Europe uh, and your and there's Israel. Fine. They should have to they should have to explain where that 100 billion is coming from, because right now they're going to just put it on the credit card. Full stop. 
But they should explain why that's an appropriate thing. That Why is this $100 billion in blowing stuff up in Ukraine and Israel a good investment for my grandchildren as yet unborn? Because that's what happens. Put it on the national credit card. Alternatively, and what would be fair and safe, would be for Mike Johnson and all of his ilk to have to come forward and say, listen, we're going to cut this $100 billion out of America so that we can send that same $100 billion somewhere else. That would be a trade-off. Then you'd have to explain it and say, listen, we're not going to do... We're not going to repair any of these bridges, the Baltimore Harbor Bridge thing there, the, the Skokie Bridge. We can't afford to fix that. And we're probably not going to be able to like put in any more solar projects and we can't give any farm subsidies this year. And um, we're going to have to cut. We're going to have to cut after school school, school programs, <laughs> sports programs, whatever. You know, just they would have to come forward and explain themselves, but they don't. They just recklessly throw it on the national bill. And trust that somehow it's all going to sort itself out. But by that, they're really just saying, eh, you know what, probably won't happen on my watch. But this is absolutely ruinous territory, but it doesn't matter, actually, at this stage. There's probably not a lot they could do. So I guess why not? Have a party, spend money, get it laundered back. Somehow it ends up back in their bank accounts. Somehow, magically, U.S. congressmen become millionaires on $174,000 salaries and wash, rinse, repeat. And it's all happening in fun and games until it breaks. This is going to break. So how do we know it's going to break? My model is the creak pop method. Just watch for the creaking and popping sounds out there. Listen for them. One of them, you should be paying attention. First off, know where to look. Right now, you ought to have full eyes on the U.S. dollar, Japanese yen pair cross. So this number 154.56 means if you had one U.S. dollar, you could buy 154.56 Japanese yen for that. That number was only 100 not that long ago. So... The Japanese yen's gone from being worth about one penny to two thirds of a penny. And there's a lot hinging on this because we, as I showed you in all those interlocked identical equity charts, there is no Japanese market compared to U.S., compared to German, compared to Europe. It's all one unimarket now. As it goes one piece of the plumbing, so goes all the plumbing is the idea. So it's a concern. It's a creaking, popping sound. Please pay attention to that, but there are many other indicators that we track for my subscribers back at Peak Prosperity. Keep your eye on the ball. This is one ball. There's many balls that we have to keep in mind right now, but watch where we are in the fiscal train wreck situation. You're going to watch interest rates. You're going to want to watch some of these other signatory things out there, like the price of gold, price of oil. There's lots of things out there that are giving us signs and clues that we are getting towards the end of this particular misadventure. And because we know that there's things now that they've written in laws into the books around the great taking where your assets might actually be their assets, heads they win, tails you lose, because of the laws that have been passed or UCC Article 8, all that stuff I did on, on following up on the great work of David Rogers Webb, well, we've created a webinar around that. It's called Protecting Your Wealth from the Great Taking and as well other things you probably want to consider. Just an educational thing, but all of the results from that are condensed into a single webinar that's going to be on June 15th. You can watch it then, or you could watch it, um, get a ticket for that, and then watch it later at your leisure because it's going to be recorded. But that will be a live webinar with experts from the legal dimension, from the Wall Street side, at really talking about this, not poo-pooing us, not telling us it's not a thing, explaining really what it is, what it isn't, where the risks are, and what we can do about it. And everybody's going to have to carve their own way through that because your situation is different from my situation and there's complexity in here. So that's why we're doing this particular webinar down here. Now, for my subscribers, though, I'm going to go on to happy stuff and we're going to be talking about uh, this. I think there's just such a compelling story coming up for silver. Not that I don't give, I don't give financial advice, <clears throat> but I do education and I've just crunched some numbers. I got some, you're going to want to see this. So if you're interested in doing that, please come by Peak Prosperity. Let me know what you think about this thesis that, you know, the panic is on the way. I, I can't see any other way around these particular numbers at this point in time. But let me know what you think down in the comments. And more importantly, come by Peak Prosperity. Let me know what you think there because that's where I hang out seven days a week. Yeah, I'm that kind of guy. I don't really, this is my life right now. I got to warn everybody I can. I want you to be safe. However you get there, please. Just get yourself to safety. Resilience is going to be exceedingly important as we go forward. Your emotional resilience, very important. Your spiritual resilience, increasingly important. 
folks, we are up against something that's really dark and this is just the time we happen to be alive. So if there's anything I can do to help you weather the storm, get through this and get through this happier, healthier, wealthier, more well-connected, that's what I, that's what I'm here to do. Myself, my team, everybody at Peak Prosperity, we wish you all the best. And again, please come by Peak Prosperity and be part of our increasing and growing tribe of people. We'd love to have you there. With that, thanks very much for listening and let me know what you think. Bye-bye.